The Inside the Boards podcasts are made possible by you guys listening to us and sharing us with your friends, but also by our sponsors like Common Bond. Common Bond is a company that helps medical students save money on their student loans. They've already helped thousands of healthcare professionals through their refinancing program, but recently launched a customized loan for current medical students with rates that beat the federal Grad Plus loan. Common Bond is the new way to pay for medical school, and ITB listeners can get a $300 bonus when they sign up. So get started at commonbond.co slash ITB. When you support our sponsors, you support us, and I super appreciate that. So check out commonbond.co slash ITB. Welcome to the Inside the Board's Study Smarter series dedicated to helping you learn to think like a question writer so you can study smarter, not harder, and succeed on your exam. All right, welcome to the Inside the Board's Study Smarter podcast. I'm Patrick Beeman, your usual host. Um, This is kind of a bonus episode as we are preparing some series of um, mini Study Smarter series for each of the clerkships, especially for our third year uh, medical student listeners. But in the meantime, we've got this episode, which um, is applicable for uh, both preclinical and clinical students and is on the subject of pulmonary stuff. One half of the episode, if you will, is on this channel and the other is on our main channel. So search inside the boards on your favorite podcatcher and uh, listen to the other half of this interview. Today, it's Greg Rodden, host of our Physiology by Physio podcast, and Dr. Ted O'Connell, ITB's chief content officer and the author of USMLE Step 2 and Step 3, Secrets, as well as Crush Step 1, as well as, honestly, a bunch of other things. Go download our iOS beta app, which has all our podcasts, some meditations specifically constructed for medical students in the throes of uh, long rotations and stressful study periods, uh, as well as our all audio cue bank, audio optimized questions for your on the go learning needs with the Step 2 version powered by Online MedEd and the Step 1 version powered by Exam Circle and Lecturio. Last thing to mention, the Pay My USMLE contest sponsored by PhysicianLoans.com, where the grand prize is payment of your USMLE or Comlex uh, registration fee. Uh, I kind of blundered with that. Uh, It's kind of complicated, but the long and the short of it is we needed to create a new link, and I was advertising the old link. Uh, so now, if you're interested in getting your board exam fee paid for, go to bit.ly slash paymyusmle2. That's paymyusmle, the number two. And uh, yeah, that's pretty much it. So we'll launch right into it. So in this case, we have a 50-year-old male with a 30-pack-year smoking history who presents with hemoptysis and wheezing. The patient complains of fatigue and muscle weakness in the morning that improves after he gets up and moving. On examination, he has a rounded and flushed face. Chest x-ray shows a 4-centimeter mass close to the junction of the carina and left main stem bronchus. Follow-up CT scan shows no other lesions. On histology, the tumor cells are positive for neuroendocrine markers. Which of the following describes the least appropriate treatment plan for this patient? Is it A, chemotherapy only? B, combination chemo and radiation therapy? C, surgical resection only? Or D, surgical resection followed by chemotherapy? You want to take us through how you think about this, Greg? Yeah, 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 absolutely. All right. So, uh, we're living in boards land. So something weird is going to be going on with a 50 year old male with a 30 pack year history of smoking. Um, 
now he's presenting to us with hemoptysis and wheezing. All right, so something's going on in his lungs, likely because of his smoking. What do we immediately think of? Lung cancer. Okay, so there are so so we've kind of narrowed down our differential diagnosis. Of course, we can't we can't bank on this, but we should definitely be leaning towards lung cancer in this in this situation. So then we find out that he has fatigue and muscle weakness in the morning that improves after he gets himself up and moving. So that is a very specific point uh, to be bringing up in a clinical vignette for a board question. And it's going to, it's kind of going to clinch the diagnosis for us. Um, but we'll, uh, we'll, we'll keep on, we'll keep on moving. So then we see that he has a rounded and flushed face. That's also kind of a weak indicator um, leaning us towards uh, the same diagnosis. Um, then we find out that he has this uh, mass that's located uh, near the carina, left main stem bronchus. Okay, so again, kind of screaming lung cancer, lung cancer, lung cancer. Okay, and then they finally tell us that it's a tumor. They biopsy the tumor, and it's got neuroendocrine markers. So all together, what this uh, is telling us is that this is a central mass. So you should either be thinking small cell lung cancer or squamous cell uh, lung cancer. And then uh, because of that very specific point about the fatigue and muscle weakness in the morning uh, gets better with use, and he's got the rounded and flushed face, it's it's got to be small cell lung cancer all the way. But of course, it's the boards. So they want us to take it one step further and know a little bit about the treatment of small cell lung cancer. Obviously, it's much more involved than what we're getting into here. But what what this question is really getting at is when the examiners were were given a topic to test you on, their essentially their objective statement was you don't treat small cell lung cancer with surgery alone. And that's why the correct answer is C, surgical resection only is the least appropriate treatment plan for this patient. Yeah, that's great, Greg. Um, I think you kind of nailed down all the real key points. Um, in cases of non-small cell lung, or, sorry, in small cell lung cancer, surgery is really just not used except in the very rare patient with a solitary pulmonary nodule without any evidence of, of distant METs or regional lymph node involvement. Uh, so it, it's kind of a straightforward answer if you know that. Um, small cell lung cancer, by the time it's diagnosed, is disseminated in most patients, uh, and it's very responsive to chemotherapy. And then you can get kind of into the details a, a little bit beyond that. With limited stage uh, um, small cell lung cancer treatments, uh, chemotherapy and radiation with more extensive stage. It's chemo with or without immunotherapy. And then if the patient responds to that, uh, they may be candidate for radiation down the line. A lot of that's probably beyond the scope of what you really need to know for the boards. You really want to get into no surgery for almost all cases of small cell lung cancer. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So another kind of helpful uh, tip from Pathoma. So Pathoma has this great line where he goes, you don't treat small cell lung cancer with surgery because the cells are too small to see. They're too small to cut out. Um, and that's, that's kind of his, his memory trick to, uh, to remember that. But really the reason is in, in all likelihood, it's metastasized by the time they present. So cutting the patient is probably going to do more harm than good. Um, plus it's, like you said, it's very susceptible to most, to a lot of chemotherapy regimens that we know about. So we opt for chemotherapy in most cases. Additionally, so I, uh, I didn't mention before the reason why that very specific phrasing was important. So what the, so what the fatigue and muscle weakness in the morning that improves as he gets himself up and moving. So what that is getting at is Lambert Eaton syndrome that is a perineoplastic manifestation of small cell lung cancer. Additionally, the rounded and flushed face that was going for Cushing syndrome. That's also a perineoplastic, uh, syndrome caused by elevated ACTH release by the tumor, um, that ends up driving up cortisol production in the adrenal glands. 
So they were basically going for the perineoplastic manifestations of small cell lung cancer there. Great. Yeah. The, I think you've covered all the important points of that question and added in that vignette about how to remember no surgery for small cell, which I had never heard before. So it's a great tip. Yeah. 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 It's a, it's a cool one. Uh, yeah, you want to okay. take us away on this uh, next vignette? Yeah. Yeah. I would love to. I would love to. All right. So an 87 year old male with severe dementia presents from his nursing home because his caretaker noticed new productive cough with foul smelling sputum. Vitals are significant for temperature of 101.3 degrees Fahrenheit. His CBC is significant for white blood cells of 12,000. Chest x-ray shows consolidation in the right lower lobe. What is the most appropriate treatment for this condition? Is it A, azithromycin? B, ceftriaxone, C, amoxicillin clavulanic acid, or D, metronidazole. So what do you think it is? Well, there's actually a lot of good stuff to talk about here, Greg, uh, in terms of thinking about this guy. So we have an older gentleman uh, who's in a nursing home. So we have to figure that he's got some chronic medical issues, perhaps debilitated or deconditioned in some way. Um, And he presents with cough and fever. And then the chest x-ray shows this right lower lobe consolidation. Uh, I think importantly in here, they point out and make the specific comment about the smell of his sputum. And with an aspiration pneumonia, you get a really putrid smelling smell to the sputum because of the anaerobes that are involved there. And so then we have to kind of look through our choices in with um, these antibiotics. Azithromycin, which is choice A, does not cover anaerobes. Ceftriaxone would not provide anaerobic coverage. Uh, the amoxicillin clavulanic acid very definitely would. Uh, and metronidazole would as well. Uh, so going with the old idea that um, that clindamycin and amoxicillin clavulanic acid are to treat above the belt line or above above the diaphragm and metronidazole below this is above the diaphragm so i would go with the uh, amoxicillin clavulanic acid 100% agree 100% agree let's see what else Oh, um, so one, one thing that I would be, one thing that I think would be helpful to point out here is with aspiration pneumonia, another one of the, uh, big time risks that you can see, or that you, another one of the complications really that you can see with aspiration pneumonia really of any kind, um, is going to be a lung abscess. Um, lung abscesses can be pretty nasty and, uh, they, it, it's interesting because their their management is pretty tricky, actually. I had a patient that I was helping to take care of. Uh, of course, this was a five-year-old kid, not an 87-year-old man. Uh, but uh, the it was interesting because we didn't really want to do anything about the abscess. Like uh, the infectious disease doc that we talked with was like, yeah, it's going to, it's going to take care of itself. So I was wondering if you could provide some, uh, some insight about that and um, like some of your, some of your experience. I think just kind of taking that from a, a broad scope, I'm a little bit surprised by that. And perhaps because it was a pediatric patient or maybe the size of the abscess influenced how they were thinking about it. But the rule of thumb is that the treatment for an abscess is draining the abscess because it's really hard for antibiotics to penetrate that, that environment. It's, it's thicker fluid and an altered pH can affect how the antibiotics work there. And so, um, you know, whether it's a skin abscess or intra- abdominal abscess or chest abscess, you very often want to drain them, you know, sometimes in a tougher spot to get to like um, an abscess from diverticulitis. If it's really small, you can give it a trial of antibiotics before you get IR or surgery involved. But yeah, getting the getting it out. And then you also by getting the 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 pus out, you can send it to the lab and culture it and gram stain it and try to figure out exactly what organism you're dealing with. Very cool. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. So it might have just been uh, one of the yeah. 
strange details of, of our case. Perhaps. Um, yeah, I don't, I'd have to know, no more details. Um, I think there's probably a few other things we could chat through about this case just as other yeah, teaching please, points. Please go for it. Um, you know, we did this kind of broad generalization about above the diaphragm and below the diaphragm. Um, the other reason why metronidazole alone is probably not an ideal choice here is if you're treating, you can use metronidazole, but you usually use it along with amoxicillin if you're treating a an aspiration pneumonia. And that really is because it's not just anaerobes that are potentially involved there. And, and you don't necessarily know in, until you get um, sputum cultures back what it is. And so you want to get the more typical pulmonary pathogens covered. And so the, the treatment choices are really amoxicillin, clavulanic acid, or the combination of amoxicillin and metronidazole. If you have a penicillin allergic patient, um, clindamycin would be a good choice. Getting into kind of things you want to, you know, we're, we're tuned into kind of dissecting these questions and looking for key phrases and things. So things you might want to, like words that you might want to be thinking about if you're thinking aspiration pneumonia, you know, this guy's age, um, increasing age is a real significant risk factor for aspiration pneumonitis and pneumonia. Other things, so if you have somebody who's got an altered level of consciousness, somebody who has um, dysphagia, disorders of the upper GI tract, somebody who's on um, G-tube feedings and is getting large volumes of feeds, um, recumbent position, near drowning situations. All of those are kind of key phrases and, and clinical scenarios where you would want to think about an aspiration pneumonia. Um, and then more recently, you know, we've seen with um, acid reducing medications, especially the proton pump inhibitors have been associated with higher risk of pneumonias, especially in the hospital. Um, and that includes aspiration pneumonia. Some of the thinking is that you're reducing the acidity of the stomach, um, changing kind of the bacterial environment there. And so then when somebody, if somebody aspirates or micro aspirates while they're on a PPI, they're getting a, a more significant bacterial load than they otherwise would with the, the acidic suppression of bacteria in the gut. So um, if you see somebody on a PPI, you know, some of the key things to think about are pneumonia and, and C. diff colitis is one of the others that's associated. So if you're looking for some word associations for the boards. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Awesome. Um, yeah. uh, actually, one more anatomy point that we should cover, though. Uh, when you aspirate, most likely it's going to go into the right, uh, the right side of the pulmonary system, right? Because of the mm -hmm. uh, shape or the orientation of the right main stem bronchus versus the left main stem bronchus. Uh, if they're sitting upright, uh, most likely it's going to be in the right lower lobe in like the posterior segment or something like that. And then beyond that, I, I don't, I don't know the rest of them <laughs> to be fair. That's frank. great. But <laughs> yeah. Uh, cool. Okay. So, and I hope I didn't steer people wrong there. Okay. Nope. So why don't you take us away with this next one? All right. We have a 45 year old man who comes to the clinic today with the chief complaint of progressive difficulty breathing and shortness of breath. His social history re reveals an occupation that clues the attending physician into ordering pulmonary function tests on this patient. The FEV1 to FVC ratio comes back as 90% with a significantly reduced FVC. Bronchoscopy with biopsy confirms the suspected diagnosis. The physician counsels the patient that his condition puts him at an increased risk of infection by mycobacterium tuberculosis. Which of the following was the patient most likely exposed to at his job? Is it A, asbestos, B, beryllium, C, coal, or D, silica? So what do you think, Greg? All right. So uh, we're gonna, I'm going to jump straight to the point here. The correct answer is D, silica. Uh, but now I, let's, we'll walk through kind of the thinking behind that. So this guy, he, we're told that he has some kind of lung pathology going on, and then we're told that his occupation matters. Then the physician orders pulmonary function testing, and the pulmonary function testing shows that he has a reduced FVC, okay? So again, indicating some kind of pulmonary pathology here, 
And the FEV1 to FVC ratio comes back as 90%. And that's, that really matters because the FEV1 to FEC ratio gives you an indication of whether this is obstructive lung disease or is this another kind of lung disease or i.e. usually restrictive lung disease. So the FEV1 to FEC ratio greater than 70% indicates that it's not obstructive lung disease, more likely it's going to be restrictive lung disease. So that helps to narrow down our differential diagnosis. Um, it points us away from obstructive diseases like COPD, like asthma kind of thing. And it points us towards, uh, some of the various causes of restrictive lung disease, whether it's like idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis or it's fibrosis due to another cause like what this guy was exposed to. The question kind of takes us down kind of a circuitous route to get to the right answer. And they give us this piece of information that he's at increased likelihood of getting a mycobacterium tuberculosis infection. So really the objective of this question was to see, do you know that um, silicosis of the lung predisposes to Mycobacterium tuberculosis infection. <laughs> um, it's kind of a weird, uh, cockamamie way of uh, getting to it, but that's what they wanted you to know. In all likelihood, uh, the kind of job that this guy had was something like sandblasting or mining where, um, you're going to be exposed to a lot of inhaled silica dust, right? And the reaction of the macrophages in the lung and the other inflammatory cells in the lung is ultimately to basically fibrose the lung and um, end up producing uh, pulmonary fibrosis. And then that ends up causing restrictive lung disease. Earlier, I mentioned that uh, FEV1 to FEC ratio really matters. So in uh, restrictive lung disease or fibrotic lung disease, the lungs are basically emptying their contents. They're, they're able to exhale really, really fast, uh, basically because the lungs kind of have like increased elasticity in a way they want to snap right back into um into place on exhalation so they'll quickly exhale and this is in contrast to obstructive lung disease where they where there's an obstruction of whether it's like the bronchi or the bronchioles kind of thing that doesn't allow air from the alveoli to get out of the respiratory tract and it takes a longer time to get the air out Hence, the FEV1 or the amount of air that they're blowing out in the first second is slowed down or the rate of exhalation is decreased. Yeah, that's great, Greg. Um, you know, this, you, you broke that down perfectly. This question, as you said, they really are aiming for you to know that silicosis is associated with tuberculosis. Um, and if you either, I think in this question, you either kind of know it or you don't, but now our listeners know that. Um, you talked about sandblasting and mining, masonry, glass and ceramic manufacturing, yeah. all associated with silicosis. Um, there is an acute and a chronic silicosis that you can get. The the chronic form is what you see. It's, you know, it's not particularly common, but you see it more commonly than the acute. Um, usually happens ten to thirty years after the exposure. If they had given us a case where they wanted us to figure out. Um, what was going on on the basis of a chest x-ray. You might be looking for multiple upper lung zone nodules. That's kind of one of the key phrases. Um, and then I think it's also worth knowing silicosis does not just affect the lungs. It, it, it's associated with um, increased risk of autoimmune disease, mm. chronic kidney disease, um, lung cancer, in addition to the restrictive process that you were talking about. Um, so, all potential um, fair game for questions on the the boards. Wow. I had no idea. All right. Well, hey, I'm learning here too. Uh, and then the, uh, the only other thing that I would mention um, is going through the other answer choices. So asbestos, um, there you're thinking about uh, asbestosis of the lung. Um, and you can see like, you can see mesothelioma. That's the one that everyone knows. And then, but I... I can't, I can't, I can never remember this. So is asbestos plus smoking like super high risk for lung cancer just in general, but not necessarily mesothelioma? Is that the idea? 
It's actually, uh, my, by my way of understanding, it's th- the risk for mesothelioma, that asbestosis in the absence of smoking um, does increase your risk, but not very much. And it's that smoking okay. um, that affects it. And then it, even further, it's the type of asbestos that you're exposed to. Um, we all get the that dumbbell um, shape on biopsy burned into our brains, but there are different types and sizes of asbestos, and there's one that really gets into the to the lung tissue and, and raises the risk. Um, I don't think that would show up on an exam, but yeah, you want to be thinking about um, as asbestos exposure with smoking really increasing your risk of mesothelioma. Oh my goodness. Yeah. I haven't thought about this stuff in a long time. I'm planning to become a pediatrician. So, uh, yeah. you, okay. you can probably dump that from your brain pretty soon. Then. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, oh, and, uh, asbestos, um, basically if they mentioned that they were like a ship worker or a construction worker, that should raise your, um, that should be a red flag for potential asbestos exposure. Uh, beryllium. I learned that apparently air, like aerospace and computer engineering or manufacturing, um, they are exposed to a lot of beryllium there. So if they mentioned that they worked on rocket ships or something, uh, think about beryllium. Yeah. That's all I got for that one. I don't have anything more to add either. <laughs> okay, cool. Well, uh, this has been fun. This has been very informative. Um, I am just so happy that we got the chance to, to chat and to go over some stuff. Um, I'm, I'm happy that I got to learn uh, from you as well. So before we go, is there anything, are there any new projects that you're working on that you would like to plug? Uh, where can people find you? All of that good stuff. Uh, well, people can find me uh, through my website. I'd be happy to communicate if they want to reach out to me by email that way. Uh, I mentioned earlier, and I think it's going to be in the show notes, but tedxoconnell.com. Uh, as you know, I'm working with Inside the Boards, um, trying to get these free podcasts out there. Um, so I think it's worth mentioning our um, Inside the Boards audio cue bank Exam circle is something I'm real passionate about. So if anybody is interested in contributing uh, questions to that crowdsourced free question bank, that would be great. I'm always writing and working on different things. So if anybody has a passion, feel free to reach out to me and we can chat and see how we might be able to get you involved. Awesome. Well, Dr. O'Connell, extraordinaire. It was great having you on the program. Uh, You're too kind, Greg. Uh, Thanks for having me, and I'll look forward to doing this again with you in the future. All right, that's it for this episode. Like I said, we've got some exciting kind of things planned. Um, I'm not going to say what they are because I have this bad habit of of being like, yeah, this is what we're doing when it's like half completed and then um, it's delayed like forever. So uh, just keep in mind I am a full-time OB hospitalist still. But I do this because I love helping you guys. And um, honestly, I just wish there had been something like this, a community that would have not only helped me learn on the go, because I love listening to podcasts and lectures in my car, uh, but also provide some encouragement uh, along the way um, of uh, medical education, at least in, in some small part. So Thank you so much. If you appreciate what we do as much as I appreciate you listening to us, please share us with your friends on social media or by word of mouth. The Study Smarter podcast is currently the number two podcast in the iTunes medicine category. Uh, And the reviews and ratings, they really, really help in the rankings. So I would love to see it at number one. I just think that'd be really cool. So if you want to help with that, of course, I'd appreciate it. We will see you back soon with more content to help you study on the go.